Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the latest Islandora 8 webinar, where we're joined by the team at the University of Prince Edward Island to look at what they're doing with research data management in Islandora 8 and how that's uh, benefiting the entire community. Uh, so joining us on the line today, we have uh, Donald Moses and Rosie Lefebvre, who are co-PIs on the project. Noella McIntyre is the project coordinator. And we also have two developers working on the project at PEI, uh, Alexander O'Neill and Alan Stanley. Uh, so we're going to be recording this session so that we can share it with those who weren't able to attend. So that'll be up on YouTube later on. And we will also have a question period at the end where you can uh, ask a follow up from this team or from me and Danny if you like. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the team at UPEI so they can show us the great work that they've been doing. Good morning, folks. Um, it's Don Moses here. And uh, if you were at Island Oricon, uh, some of the material we're going to show this morning uh, may be a duplicate, but we've got new uh, uh, content as well that shows uh, some of the functionality. Um, feel free to ask questions via whatever methods appropriate uh, uh, during the webinar and, and we'll do our best to, to answer those questions. Uh, so just to, as a backgrounder, um, at UPEI we have a, a large uh, Islandora footprint. Uh, we have Drupal uh, Islandora 7 and uh, 8 sites. Um, we've got all kinds of uh, different uh, flavors of Islandora, institutional repositories, uh, data repositories, digital collections, administrative sites, and, and if you name it, uh, we probably have a, a, an example of it or have tried it. Uh, this particular project uh, for us is to uh, bridge between our current data management repository and uh, to build some capacity uh, with Islandora 8 and get a good understanding of that framework and uh, try to contribute back to the community uh, uh, some of the generalized work that would apply across all uh, Islandora 8 uh, domains. Uh, I would like to thank Canary who has provided support for this project. Uh, so uh, in order to, to do this work, uh, we've uh, applied for and received funding from Canary, and that has been um, instrumental in providing us uh, with an opportunity to develop uh, against uh, Islandora 8 and to pull a, a, an effective team together. Uh, just as a, a, a note, uh, and it's probably in our future notes as well, uh, we've also put an application in for the next uh, funding call uh, for the research data management platforms. Um, and hope to be uh, funded uh, again. Uh, so this particular project uh, is looking to develop a whole series of integrations around uh, identifier services, metadata services, authentication services, uh, storage and dissemination systems, and other services that support the research data lifecycle and uh, focus on the FAIR principles. So that's important uh, uh, for getting research data discovered, reused, uh, and uh, uh, accessible to, to researchers and others that want to uh, have access to that data. And so for our project, the goal is uh, basically an out-of-the-box uh, profile uh, that has a series of uh, sensible defaults, useful configurations uh, that institutions who are curating or managing research data over its life cycle can implement. Um, again, there are things that are needed within that platform that are also functionality that are needed outside uh, the platform as well. So hopefully there's uh, some good uh, crossover there. Would love to hear from people who are either using Islandora in whatever version as a research data management platform and what you feel are the features or requirements uh, needed most uh, at your uh, institution. Uh, so this is a simplified uh, research lifecycle diagram 
and you can have a, a sense of, or more maybe I'll just run through some of the what are the interconnections between uh, that life cycle approach and how uh, Islandora 8 fits within that. So for planning, uh, we have a DMP creation tool uh, embedded in the platform. Uh, collecting, uh, we don't directly support collecting uh, through the interface, but if we're thinking about how do researchers or how do we get research data from external platforms or uh, basically uh, researchers' desktops, uh, that would be a, an example of, of collecting uh, deposits. So deposit into the uh, Islandora platform, uh, adding capabilities around logins so that uh, other credentials could be used uh, within that content context. Uh, having rich metadata that uh, a researcher and others can use to describe their data set and support for a variety or any, any file format. Uh, on the discover side, people will be very familiar with solar and its use, um, but we also uh, ensure that other data like uh, technical metadata through FITS or uh, data scraped from PDFs or other textual content is also indexed. Uh, we're enriching the metadata through a whole series of uh, external lookups that include the, the label of the item along with the URI. Um, around preserve, so uh, there's been a, a, a variety of different approaches and work around uh, preservation, including uh, work done uh, primarily by Mark Jordan, but a lot of work by our team to actually integrate that into the platform and, and test it and uh, move it from sort of proof of concept to something that's functional. Uh, so the RipRap service, which is, uh, I guess we would call it our checksum checker, uh, a Bagot service, a, a microservice, and, and FITS, which is used to extract technical metadata. Uh, one thing we don't have, uh, but again, we're thinking hard about it, is uh, what are the preservation actions? So using contexts and other tools uh, within Islandora 8 to automatically trigger uh, preservation actions. Um, so again, getting feedback from the community, hearing from the community about what that might need be for them would be would be really interesting. Uh, so under reuse, we ensure that uh, data sets have licenses, uh, that a DOI uh, for a, a, a publication, a data publication is generated on, on publication. Um, the metadata we have within the repository is, is basically Drupal file fields, but we uh, export a data site XML file to a data site, and that's aggregated through their uh, uh, data search service. Um, Alexander's been working on um, exposing um, structured schema uh, or .org uh, metadata. Uh, through the interface so that uh, Google Datasets uh, search service can harvest uh, that content. And um, again, we support uh, through uh, community contributions, the OAI module, uh, uh, and uh, those are all good things that support reuse. Uh, so this is our sort of uh, reinterpretation of uh, the system diagram. <laughs> it's sort of uh, uh, a diagram that helps us sort of visualize how our work is integrated within the, in, uh, the larger Islandora 8 project. Uh, and so you can see that there are uh, microservices that we leverage uh, so Hypercube, uh, Homeris, and, and Houdini around uh, text extraction, uh, images, and, and video. Um, the preservation microservices that have been added around Fitz, Rip, Wrap, and Bagot. Uh, we're obviously leveraging uh, solar, and uh, we're modestly using uh, uh, Blaze Graph and the RDF uh, storage. Under the file uh, uh, storage abstraction piece, uh, we've tested uh, in the project a number of different options uh, for external file storage, including uh, Amazon's S3. Uh, we've tested uh, SFTP on our uh, Compute Canada instance, and we've 
started uh, some initial work looking at, at Globus and how that might be integrated. Uh, Globus requires a um, subscription for anything beyond transfer, uh, but our testing with transfer has, has gone really well so far. Uh, and so knowing that a number of uh, Canadian institutions anyway will be using Globus, uh, knowing how that would work within the system would be of interest. And then you can see below that a whole series of uh, Drupal integrations that we've worked on uh, or that we've, uh, you know, they're contrib modules. So we've been able to just implement them out of the box uh, along with uh, configuration. Nothing is out of the box. Um, So this is just a really simplified uh, uh, diagram of uh, the content types we've been working on, uh, including a content type for a data management plan, uh, a content type for a research data set, and, and another for funding. And uh, within the data set uh, metadata, uh, data site includes a, a related uh, um, item uh, type element uh, within the data set. And so uh, we can reference other, uh, whether it's other things that cite the data set or that are cited by, uh, something that's the same as, um, and, and or is a derivative of, and, and so on. Uh, so there's, uh, I think, an opportunity for some rich uh, relationship metadata uh, within the framework. But we're just starting to explore that. So this is, uh, again, uh, we're doing some screen captures. Uh, this is, I think I missed a slide. So uh, we use the DMP roadmap uh, uh, software as a model and basically use their generic form to model a Drupal form. Um, so right now, some of the functionality we've got with the data management plan is that uh, users can share unpublished DMPs with other users uh, through the um, the name of the module is escaping me. Yeah, workflow participants module. Uh, so you can assign someone uh, an editor role or a view role on a data set you've uploaded as long as they're in the uh, uh, system already. Um, yeah, and we can also export uh, DMPs uh, through the usual Drupal methods. Uh, this is a screenshot uh, that provides a, an overview. This will change. Uh, so for instance, we've got a share tab, uh, but we're going to leverage the workflow participants module so that that is surfaced in the uh, uh, view of the uh, uh, data management plan for, for the user. And uh, you can see there's uh, some basic information there along with a, a cross-ref funder uh, DOI lookup. Uh, that's a lookup uh, that provides, you know, I typed in uh, NSF and it fills out uh, the National Science Foundation and then uh, pops the uh, DOI into the uh, service as well. And again, we can use that DOI for other kinds of uh, connections or lookups uh, in the future. Uh, again, this is uh, just a, a series of questions and guidance uh, that a user would go through uh, to fill out a data management plan and then they would save it. Excuse me. Um, one of the options uh, 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 for users to log into the system is that they can log in with their ORCID credentials. Uh, in order to do that, they first need to link their ORCID account. Uh, so you need to log in as yourself and then uh, go to your profile and link your ORCID account. Thereafter, uh, you can log in uh, using ORCID. And here's a video. Let me know if this works or doesn't work for folks. So just going through, I clicked on the login using ORCID. I'm logging in with my username and password. And it goes back uh, to our system and says, hey, you're logged in. Welcome. Um, okay. 
Uh, here's an example of uh, the option for researchers to share uh, a data set and permissions around a data set. Again, this is using the workflow uh, participants, participants module, and this is just a screen capture of, uh, so for instance, uh, adding Noella uh, here as a, uh, an editor on that. And once I add that, then Noella would have uh, full editorial access to that data set. Um, we're doing our best to add uh, rich metadata around uh, data sets, um, again, to make them uh, discoverable, to have them fully described. Um, and uh, again, we're modeling it based on the data site uh, 4.2 schema. Uh, we need to uh, monitor that because there's already a new uh, version of the schema out. And so how do we make sure that we're able to migrate? Uh, one of the beauties is the we're using Drupal fields to represent that, that data. Uh, so it could be uh, simply uh, the addition of a new Drupal field or a remapping of an existing Drupal field uh, to match the, uh, the, the newer schemas as they uh, come out. Of course, there may be other bigger changes uh, that we don't uh, anticipate. I wonder if uh, uh, Rosie or Alexandra would want to talk about the fields, uh, entity forms, and particularly paragraphs, and why we're using uh, those. Uh, sure. Well, um, paragraphs lets you um, add more complex uh, representations of things. Uh, so normally, a node field is just has a direct relationship. It's a text field or something attached directly to a node. Uh, but for example, we wanted to model creators and contributors and uh, every creator has a name and an affiliation. Uh, I just broke one of the rules about names. Not every person has a name, but every creator we say has a name, um, uh, has an affiliation, has, um, uh, if they're, and contributors are also the same. They're a, either a person or an organization. Uh, if they're an organization, it has a URL, it has a homepage, it has um, various metadata about it. And if we wanted, we wanted to attach multiple contributors to a node, and each of those contributors has things about that contributor. And so paragraphs is kind of a way of letting you have complex entities that are attached to a node, but don't kind of have their own URL or their own sort of externally accessible uh, uh, existence. And also they are revision locked to the parent node. So if you update a entity it's, uh, and you create a new revision on the node, it's, it's all sort of visible directly by the node where if you just used regular entity references, you could make a change to a creator and it wouldn't show up as a change applying to the node. So it's kind of a nice way of having a complex relationship with uh, around fields uh, while retaining the node as the kind of uh, singular addressable uh, item. Okay. And this allows us to model the complex hierarchies that data site XML requires mm -hmm. um, for the next part when we serialize it. So those um, complexities that Alexander was talking about allow us to say, here's our contributor with an attribute of contributor type, and then here's their name and optionally identifier um, and optionally their affiliation with their affiliations identifier and nesting all of those hierarchical things using paragraphs um, allows us to um, make them on the fly. Um, in this case, using like we're using the identifiers to link things um, as as linked data to identify them. Um, the names that we're recording are just strings; they're not reusable entities. Uh, we've got some examples of the other things on this slide, so I'll, I'll pop by that. Just to note that, um, again, uh, we're working on mapping that metadata uh, to Fedora and determining the best path forward there. Um, and the importance of DOIs or identifiers in general uh, within the framework uh, can't be stressed enough. So when we've got a, a unique identifier, a persistent identifier, um, that is helpful uh, so people can then cite uh, 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 the, the record 
Uh, it can be shared uh, in other ways, um, and it can be used as a, a, a query uh, access point uh, when doing other lookups. Uh, this is just an example of uh, one of the widgets that the team built. Uh, this does a lookup of the Library of Congress subject headings. And basically, once you select uh, a term, uh, it automatically populates the associated uh, uh, URL uh, for that uh, uh, authority. Uh, this is another example of uh, metadata that's added. Uh, in this case, um, again, the team built a uh, media attribution module, and maybe I'll just let the team speak to that. Uh, sure. So um, we're mostly using this module as a kind of uh, holder for uh, licenses, uh, but I actually built this for another project, which is a academic journal uh, platform. And there, uh, I used, uh, we're using it to add attributions to uh, media when you embed it into a document. So like, let's say you uh, take a, an image off of Wikipedia, which is licensed under uh, the Wikipedia open license. Uh, or if you take a license that's uh, an image from somewhere that's where it's licensed under a certain Creative Commons license, you can uh, as you embed the media into uh, your uh, body field, you can specify this is the source, uh, this is the name of the uh, entity or name of the uh, object that I'm embedding, and here's the original address and the license it's published under. And the uh, entity or the media attribution will kind of mark it up in the way that using HTML5 tags and proper kind of block quote syntax uh, around that, which we aren't really using directly right now, but it's kind of a, a useful way to think about, you know, when you include content in your Drupal site uh, using media, all of that content should be properly attributed. And this is kind of a good sort of shortcut around that. But also, if you just want to tag a piece of content with a license, this uh, provides a taxonomy and a way of bulk quoting licenses using a draft script for that. And just as an example, I added the Open Government License Canada to the taxonomy, and then it's accessible uh, within the interface. And I missed a slide, so I'm just going to go back one. Sorry about that. Uh, this is just, uh, uh, there is a uh, data site uh, XML rendering of um, the data set objects uh, uh, within the repository. And so there's a, a URL endpoint for uh, a data site XML that people can Again, used for uh, particular purposes that we might not know about yet. Uh, just uh, a note on funding information uh, that uh, um, we've integrated it into uh, the uh, data set metadata form uh, so that uh, users, if they know what their funding information might be when they're entering that data site or, or data set, uh, they can add that funding information at that point uh, so it's not disconnected. And there's a, uh, an option in, in uh, again, that uh, Alan Stanley built uh, that does a query of uh, cross refs, uh, fund ref uh, 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 data. Um, and I'm just catching up here, sorry. Yep. So for whatever reason, when I push the button, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I'm not seeing uh, a slide here, but that's okay. I uh, will share the slides out uh, after the uh, uh, session and uh, feel free to, to look at those. Um, this is uh, how we're our, making our uh, data accessible. Uh, so again, this is a, a, a solar configuration. I don't know if the team wants to speak to that at all. Uh, I don't know if folks in the community are uh, integrating uh, uh, all kinds of metadata, but for us, it's uh, the data set metadata, but it would also include things like uh, the technical metadata, so things scraped out of fits, uh, and it would also include uh, any textual uh, content that might be scraped out of a, um, 
a PDF or other uh, textual uh, record. Uh, you can see that we're leveraging uh, facets. Um, and again, we don't have a whole bunch of uh, search data. Uh, so it, it, it just basically provides a, a proof of concept that, yep, this works as, as, uh, as expected. Um, so for us, uh, because when we publish to uh, data site, uh, we push uh, the uh, metadata package to data site and they aggregate it in their platform. Uh, obviously, we're not publishing uh, data sets uh, yet, uh, but that's where those will be discovered. Um, and so right now in our current uh, uh, data repository, we have similar functionality and, and data sets are, are uh, populated uh, through that. Um, through the OAI PMH, uh, the REST OAI PMH uh, module, uh, we can uh, expose our uh, data uh, for harvesting. And uh, we've set that up and, and done some testing and that's working well. We had uh, one small gotcha, which was ensuring that uh, our content type that we wanted harvested was made uh, available through the, uh, uh, the view that comes with that module. Uh, and also we've uh, leveraged a contributor, contributed module, uh, the simple sitemap XML module, um, and are using that uh, in, the, in the platform. Again, a short video. If there's sound, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> a quick demo of the simple XML sitemap module as it relates to the RDM uh, project context. We've got a uh, use and closure to pull the module down. Uh, you can select configure. Uh, you've got a number of tabs at the top. You want to select sitemap entities and uh, I've configured content type for RDM data sets already. Uh, you need to enable the checkbox. You need to actually go to the content type, uh, manage it, and select edit, and uh, add uh, the simple XML sitemap, uh, and add that entity to the uh, harvesting or indexing of, of entities for XML sitemap. Uh, you can come back to the configuration text on site map and you can rebuild uh, your site map and view the results as it looks like. All right. Let us know if those videos are, are useful. Um, so we often uh, do videos or otherwise try to demonstrate functionality uh, at uh, uh, demo days uh, internally here. Um, so we're happy to share those out. Uh, under preservation strategies, um, uh, the team, primarily Alan uh, Stanley, has worked on a whole series of microservices uh, to support uh, uh, that uh, um, aspiration within the uh, framework. And uh, he's produced a series of videos and that one's not showing up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's there. Uh, so again, maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just have a, I don't know if I can escape out and show that separately, Melissa, but um, I'll just uh, uh, pass over this one for now. And if there's time at the end, I'll pop out and, and see why that's not uh, displaying. Uh, but basically, Alan, do you want to do a, just a, a, a speak to what that video looks like? Oh, sure. It's, uh, it's a microservice that's set up with the, uh, the usual arrangement of actions in context so that when an original file is ingested, uh, the, uh, the microservice uh, queue fires off a request uh, to the, uh, the FITS web service, brings back XML, we parse the XML out till we get something that's, uh, that's easy to read. Um, the interesting thing we did on this one is that each value that comes back, and we have no idea what's coming back, because different uh, different inputs will bring back all kinds of different outputs. 
uh, paramount into key value pairs. And if we have not seen that key before, we'll create a storage and then create a file instance of it. Uh, so the uh, long story uh, endless uh, version of this is that you now have uh, a specific field for every item that comes back from FITS, which is indexable and solarizable. Uh, but the short version of all this is you fire it off and get readable text back, so you have all the technical metadata associated with your digital asset, pretty much irrespective of what your digital asset is. It's going to bring back results on images, on CSVs, on doc files, PDFs, uh, so any technical data you may be interested in, including the text. All right. Uh, so the next slide is about RipRap. Um, and Alan, I know there's no sound with this, but if you wanted to just narrate it as it goes, that would be handy. Oh, sure. Fast talker. Fast talker. So here we are just pulling up an asset that has been ingested. And when we go to the media tab, instead of the media tab you're used to, it has an extra field on the end, which gives you the result of the fixity auditing, which is all done through the microservice. Uh, the microservice will run a task uh, through a cron job uh, and will run that uh, however you set it up. We have it set up for, uh, for a daily run, but you can do that weekly, monthly, hourly, whatever seems reasonable to you. Uh, and it will check the, uh, check the checksums to make sure that they're still what we we're hoping. Uh, and if they were not, if there's some kind of an error, uh, there is another cron job uh, which will fire off an email to the site administrator. Uh, or anybody with the uh, anybody with that particular role uh, that will let them know that something is up and your uh, your files are failing. So it's just a way of uh, making sure that your data stays intact. Awesome. And so there's two pieces to this work. One is the microservice that's on the back end, and then a a module that surfaces this information within the within the framework. Uh, and I should probably note the reason we're seeing this in Bartik instead of uh, Carapace is that the fields don't actually fit in in Carapace, so we're going to have to look at for this meeting point of view. Okay. Um, and again, this is uh, another uh, part of our, our preservation strategy, uh, and that uh, relates to, to Bagot, so um, packaging up uh, uh, content into either archival information packages that we can ship to you know, storage somewhere else, or Glacier, um, somewhere else on campus, uh, you name it. Uh, and the other side is uh, one that I've been thinking about. Uh, again, I don't know how practical it is, but it would be useful to hear from the community. Uh, perhaps generating a, uh, a bag either on, on ingest or on demand. It can do that now, um, but for research data sets, they're complex objects, so it's not a, uh, you know, you could download the CSV file or the zip file, uh, but often you might miss context. So the data dictionary that goes with it, that would help you understand that data and so on. So providing a, a package that a researcher could use uh, when, when they downloaded uh, a research uh, data set, as opposed to just a file download, uh, provide a, another form there. Alan, I'm going to get you to talk through this again. Sure. So here we have, uh, we have an item. We click the bag request. And the bag request uh, then, and this does not use the graph queue. This sends off, um, uh, sends off a request uh, over a uh, REST interface to the microservice, which then adds that item to a queue, which will be processed uh, whenever you like. So it's, uh, we've got it set up as a cron job that runs, runs once a day. So whatever you've added to that queue will be processed at that time and then the bag will be left uh, at wherever you have designated in your config file. So we've got temp here uh, and one of the, uh, the obligations that you will have as a user uh, is to have some place that these bags can be retrieved. So you can see what we've done there is we've created it, uh, we've treated it out, you can see everything that's in that. And the Bagot uh, microservice is extensible. So if there are other things 
uh, that you may want to preserve uh, that aren't there, uh, you'd have an opportunity uh, to do that. So for instance, one of the things we'd probably want to preserve is a, a serialized version of our data site XML as part of that package. Yeah, and the other important thing about this microservice is you're not confined to a single configuration. The configuration is pulled for each object which is run. So you may well have a different config that you want to run on different content types uh, or whatever reasons you have for yourself. But the uh, on every run, a very specific uh, configuration file is read in. Uh, so it can be, you can have as many of those as you like. You can set up as many contexts as you like. So you can see that there's some, some work around uh, the Bagot piece that still needs to get done. Um, and if you're using Bagot uh, within an Island or eight context, uh, it would be great to hear from you. So why are we pursuing this project at, at UPEI? Um, so I think one of the things uh, we're using this project for, and uh, again, a lot of our other projects are, are similar uh, in nature in that uh, researchers are in their own labs, uh, they're in their own departments. Um, so it's an opportunity to remove barriers uh, so that we can have discussions with uh, researchers, we can help them uh, manage their research data. Um, we did a survey uh, a couple of years ago now and there is a need. Uh, so, you know, people have hard drives in their file cabinets or they're using flash drives or uh, Dropbox or you name uh, whatever external file storage option there might be. Uh, researchers are using that. And so how can we help facilitate an improved uh, uh, approach to uh, stewarding research data on, on campus? Uh, we want to build capacity both within the library and with researchers uh, so that there's an improved understanding of, of uh, research data management. Uh, you know, one of the reasons we've got a, a data repository is that our researchers are doing great work and we want to make sure that that work is uh, surfaced for our local community, but also for uh, other international researchers. We're known for lots of different things. Um, you know, we're leaders in aquaculture research, for example, and epidemiology around aquaculture. Um, so you can imagine lots of data around that. Climate research, uh, lots of data around that. How do we make sure that that gets uh, uh, shared out uh, appropriately? And again, we want to re encourage reuse and we want our, our researchers to get citations on their, on their uh, data that they're producing. And data is valuable. Um, so a lot of effort goes into creating data and, and managing it. And so uh, making sure that it, it's stewarded is, is a good thing. So future development. Um, Alan has been working on, on TUS. And so I'll let him speak to that uh, uh, facet. Uh, yeah, TUS is uh, it's a pretty excellent little system. Uh, it will replace Plupload, which never worked really well in the, uh, in the Drupal 8 context. Uh, so it allows for uh, resuming uploads uh, once they've been started. It allows for the reuse of files, uh, which is kind of an interesting concept from a uh, data uh, management point of view. Um, and there's been uh, that's a that's a discussion for another time, but it does mean that the same file can be used for two or more different objects with different sets of metadata associated with them. Um, we had to make a number of changes. The uh, the TUS module, uh, which is pretty solid, uses the UPI file uh, file upload widget. Um, is pretty solid, but does not deal very nicely with external file systems. Uh, so we did some rewriting on that. We have something that's pretty stable and works well. Uh, and the next thing I think we'd like to develop for TUS is the ability to read not only from the computer that you're uploading from, but to pull it in from a URL, which then kind of solves the problem of using uh, moving big pieces of data around because the, uh, the file uploader, uh, uploader uh, is resumable, uh, will run fine if you turn your browser off. 
uh, it's just a lot more bomb proof than the, uh, than the standard system of uploading files that kind of happens in real time. There are, there are still a bunch of constraints around that. Uh, so, you know, you, you need a system that can accommodate large file upload. Um, simply enabling TUS doesn't do that for you. You need to make sure your PHP settings are correct, that you have enough storage on your temp uh, directory or wherever those files are going. Uh, and so again, still more testing uh, required there, but if that's your use case, um, we're, we're we're happy to see that TUS is, is a potential option for us and potentially for the community because it would be useful generally uh, within the community uh, because of those uh, uh, benefits that uh, it brings to an upload process. UX improvements, UI improvements. Um, We're always thinking about making this a system that the users will enjoy using um, rather than having to learn our complicated data models and the ideas of media and how those work. Uh, we like to make it as simple as possible and kind of match their view of their object, their, their data set and their metadata. Um, so we're thinking about how we present the object, how we use ingest forms. We know that Danny is actively working on that. So we're excited to see those results. Um, and in general, making the you know, search and navigation something that is intuitive and uh, easy to use. We're also um, looking at uh, improving the base, the carapace theme uh, to just sort of uh, deal with some of the things that uh, we think could be improved in that too. So hopefully we can contribute some of that stuff back. Yep. So I think, you know, as a, as a person, I would call myself a, a user uh, in, in, on the team side here and, and uh, Noella as well, just using the system sort of highlights um, what I would feel are some issues. So I, I'm, I'm uh, probably not a good tester because I'm accepting of things that don't work a hundred percent. And I recognize that, okay, that, that, that might be fixed or that is fixable. Uh, but I think we really need, uh, again, within Islandora itself as well, some sort of user testing that is uh, not so uh, forgiving uh, that, you know, they'll tell us, wow, this is a, a process that really stinks. You know, I have to fill out all these forms or how can we simplify it for, for the user? So making them fill in, for instance, a title uh, for media again, when we might be able to use a token to populate that. Um, there are some architectural pieces too that we've been uh, struggling with a bit around, uh, you know, nodes and, and media and just our own um, uh, model of, of how we're trying to imagine uh, research data sets. Again, they're complex. Um, there may be a number of original files, so you can imagine that data might be collected annually and so there's a data set that has, you know, 10 years worth of data and each year is its own data set. Uh, there would be supplementary information included with those data sets. Uh, that might be data dictionaries, um, mapping of, of uh, uh, content, other uh, concerns or considerations around the data that need to be shared. Um, so I think trying to understand that uh, will be generally helpful for the community, but again, would love to hear from the community because I'm guessing other people don't have one-to-one -one, uh, relationships with their, their content. Yeah, and so just the, uh, the final thing is, you know, our hope uh, for uh, a successful uh, application for uh, the submission we had for uh, Canary's RDM call. And so we're looking at adding additional functionality uh, uh, to the platform uh, with that call. And I think that's it. Uh, that's our public uh, space where we blog about uh, the project. Uh, thank you to Noella for keeping that uh, updated. And you can also see how uh, we are uh, basically highlighting how fair uh, the, the platform is 
and how it adheres to the, to the FAIR uh, guidelines. Would be happy to hear if there were any questions from folks. You got the team in the room. I'm seeing there was a comment uh, in the chat from about 15 minutes ago that the audio quality got bad. Uh, just wanted to check if, apologies for not seeing that right away. Um, and okay, problem during the first video, cool. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I, I didn't realize it was, <clears throat> I couldn't see the video for some reason, but <clears throat> I could hear the bad audio and I wasn't sure if the video was playing or if that was Don, because it was still Don's voice. So. I, I know. It was Don's voice coming out of a computer speaker <laughs> and back into the microphone. So. A apologies. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I should have killed the video or the audio on that one. So we're happy to take questions if anybody. Anyone? <laughs> When do you expect to start using this? When do we expect to start using it? That's a great question. So the, the grant funding uh, on the current project ends March uh, 2020. Uh, one of the tasks we have to uh, complete before uh, the end of uh, the project is a migration of our current uh, data platform uh, to the, the new platform. And so it's not going to be a uh, uh, a sort of a straight uh, transfer in that we're, we're not using data site uh, in our current uh, data management platform. So there's going to be a, a mapping requirement uh, from uh, the, the metadata schema we're using there uh, to um, uh, the new. Uh, so that work needs to be done before the end of, of March. And I would anticipate that after that, you know, all things being equal, uh, that we would be able to do a, a relaunch of the platform on Islandora 8. I mean, we want to get an example of a production Islandora 8 platform out to the community so that they can see uh, the uh, capabilities uh, of, of the platform, if that sounds fair. No. Oh, <clears throat> I'll ask one then. Um, could you maybe speak a little bit to what uh, what you've demoed here today that's not standard or core, or and what's um, what is what's been contributed, what will be contributed soon? I know some pieces from this are coming into Islandora eight, and just to give the audience a sense of what what they get out of the box and what you've done yourselves. Okay, maybe I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the end. We'll go back to the ant diagram. Uh, I don't know if that's helpful. Um, so I think a lot of the really custom stuff were our content types. Um, and, you know, we made them for an RDM flavored Islandora. So we're not intending to have them distributed with core Islandora as like as default or anything like that but they are available through a module in case somebody wants to install an RDM flavor of Islandora for their own platform. Um, so that includes our data management plan, our funding information, and our data set model. Mod model, yes. Um, we also have the integration with data site, i.e. where we can turn our metadata into XML we can send that out to them and get a DOI back and they index our XML. Um, so that is one module that, again, it's available. Um, we, won't, we don't suggest turning on that DOI minting, of course, if you're just running a test site and you do need some API credentials for that. Um, so those are some things that um, are not going, quote unquote, into core Islandora. Um, the things that are, are mostly our microservices so the riprap, um, the fits, the text extraction, text extraction is already in. Hypercube. Yeah, hypercube integration. Yeah. Um, so those are, those are pretty fun. 
and very generalizable, of course. Um, there are other modules like the, our, our lookup, um, the thing that was using the Library of Congress subject headings. Um, right now, the module is called LCSH lookup, but it includes a lot of other API endpoint lookups other than LCSH, and we are going to refactor the name of that module so that it's a little more reflective of it. Um, but again, that's, that's available to anyone in the community, heck, in the Drupal community, who wants to do those kinds of uh, value plus URI fields where you get that combo and you get a, an autocomplete from an external lookup. So, like, um, in anywhere I could, I tried to make a module not strictly an island or a module, but be a, a module that I can put up on Drupal.org. So, that was one, and the media attribution module is perfectly usable completely outside of Islandora, but also useful inside of Islandora, which I love about Islandora 8, um, as well as uh, we had a co-op student who worked with us over the summer, and she created a field formatter for showing previews of CSV data, and that was all done just as a standard Drupal module. So I, I'm, I'm enjoying the fact that I can kind of write those things and have them be useful outside of Islandora as well as inside of Islandora. There was a, a, a contrib module, the ORCID module on, on Drupal.org uh, that we have uh, taken over uh, support for. Um, the other lookups uh, that, that are uh, possible that again are just sort of surface at the, so there's a grid ID lookup, but that's actually a Wikidata, Wikidata lookup. So you can imagine that you could leverage that for all kinds of other potential metadata enrichment. So for us, we're using it to do a grid lookup uh, because uh, grid doesn't provide a API for their database. Um, again, we're looking at things like, you know, part of the job I think is, is sort of kicking the tires and testing a lot of uh, things. So for instance, Hypercube was part of Islandora 8 for a while, but hadn't been implemented. So again, we went through the process of implementing it and then doing the Ansible piece around it, um, which is substantial. And I'm sure anyone who's done that work uh, will have a sense of, of what's required there. But even things like the CLAM AV module. Um, so every file that gets ingested into the repository is also checked for viruses. Um, that would have utility for any uh, Islandora uh, repository, uh, but again, things need to be tested. Editorial workflow. Uh, so we didn't touch on that really within the uh, presentation, but we've got uh, for us a draft, uh, published, and archive uh, workflow. Um, and depending on who you are, uh, you would be able to do uh, uh, or change the states of those uh, uh, objects um, as part of your uh, creation. Um, And so for instance, for, we can't let a user delete a data set um, because we have to maintain tombstone data. So if the data set's been published, we need to maintain uh, the metadata about that data set and provide a, a life cycle message that says, this is why the uh, media or the, the actual data set content was removed. Um, and again, just thinking about that as uh, things that would be useful. The meta tag schema.org work, uh, Alexander had, hadn't mentioned that, but he's contributing back uh, a schema.org uh, metadata uh, or meta tag module for the data set. Um, and again, that's something that I think the community uh, can leverage tremendously. So I use the meta tag schema for um, exposing our Dublin Core metadata through the REST OAI uh, PMH module. So there were a couple of options and I used the, the meta tag module because you can basically grab your tokens and pop them into uh, those fields. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Absolutely did. Um, are there other questions for, for the team? I know we're approaching time here, but we've probably got time for at least one more if anyone has something they'd like to ask or something they'd like to see more of.
And you can use either the chat or you can unmute and ask it with voice if you prefer. Anyway, I, I would I would welcome any feedback from from the community. Um, we're going to try to do a uh, more work on 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 getting information out. Uh, so if you go to the GitHub, the GitHub.com slash Rob Lib, uh, we've tagged uh, modules uh, that are part of this project as Islandora 8 and RDM-085, uh, which is our project number. Uh, so you can uh, go to our GitHub and, and use that as a way to uh, corral uh, those modules together because we've got a lot of other modules in our in our Roblib GitHub that are not uh, related to this project. Uh, so that'll give you a sense uh, of, of how that works. We've got a playbook there as well. Uh, so again, if you wanted to kick the tires uh, and you're bold enough to use a playbook, then go for it. Uh, Internally, we're trying to figure out something easier and maybe uh, the dev devs are going to get the playbook running and, and then export an ANOVA for us. And maybe that would be a useful uh, uh, thing uh, for the community. So something you could import into your own virtual box and, and run out of there instead of uh, 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 running the, the playbook. Um, would be interested to hear uh, from the community around that. I know I downloaded the Islandora 8 uh, virtual box image and found that to be uh, really useful. Okay. We'll be posting the recording. I will also uh, gather up links and slides and contact information from the team afterwards and put that out for everyone who's attended and wants to follow up. Uh, thank you very much to the team at Robertson Library for joining us and showing us the really cool stuff you're doing. And uh, really looking forward to seeing the, I guess, never a completed project because there's always more improvements to be made, but uh, seeing where this lands the next several months. Great. And uh, th thank you very much to everyone who joined us. Just a reminder, we will have another webinar in two weeks going over migration tools for going from Islandora 7 to Islandora 8. And uh, I'll share out that registration link in communications afterwards as well. Awesome. Cheers. Thanks, Brian. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Thanks, guys.